It's like the black hole of Calcutta. It's a phrase that British people trot out whenever they describe an overcrowded, stuffy room. Del Boy in Only Falls and Horses uses it. So too do characters in Open All Hours and Steptoe and Son. It appears as a descriptor in classic literature, such as William Makepeace Thackeray's Vanity Fair, through to more recent authors like Stephen King. But where does the phrase actually come from? Well, it's based upon real events in history. Back in 1756, a group of British prisoners, sources range between 64 and 146, were confined in a tiny prison cell in India. Crushed together, dehydrated and suffocating in the humid and claustrophobic heat, when they were released the following morning, less than a third were still alive. This is the real story behind the black hole of Calcutta. Since the 1600s, the British East India Company had been operating in India, and whilst we tend to see them with the benefit of history as the dominant force in the subcontinent, they were initially just one of many European rivals. Back in the 1700s, there were also French, Dutch, Danish, and Swedish East India Companies too. There was even a Flemish one, the Ostend Company, and then there were also the Portuguese. The British East India Company would eventually end up directly ruling a large part of the Indian subcontinent, but in the early days, they and their rivals were more interested in trade than empires. However, just like commerce today, trade and politics went hand in hand. Commercial entities always look to governments to help them increase their profits, whether that's through tax regimes, contracts, or, as was often the case in India, a monopoly at the expense of your rivals. So consequently, all those European companies, many like the British and French acting as proxies for their governments, were constantly seeking commercial advantage with local rulers over their rivals. It happened that during this period, the Mughal Empire started to fragment, enabling local rulers to increase their power and effectively rule in total independence to, or paying lip service, to the Mughal emperors in Delhi. Thus, this fragmenting of central power offered opportunities for those various East India companies. And equally, their willingness to play rival Indian rulers off against each other presented those rulers with opportunities too, or at least so they thought. If these Europeans, with their firepower, sided with you, then you could defeat your rival. But this in turn meant that your rival would seek to balance the books by allying himself with another European company. And two of those companies, above all the others, became the preferred allies and consequently started to elevate their own positions of power on the subcontinent. The French and the British East India Companies. The European trading companies built forts at various points along the coast to protect their trading warehouses or factories as they called them. Protect them from who? Well, firstly, the local Indian regimes, which might have a change of heart as to which Europeans they allowed to trade in their territory, if they allowed them at all. And secondly, from their European rivals. I said earlier that these East India companies, whilst commercial entities, were closely linked to their respective governments. Thus, if ever there was a conflict back in Europe, and trust me, there were a lot at this time, the potential for the companies to be forced to back their government by attacking their rivals in India was all too real. And of course, that could mean yet more commercial advantage. And so the forts were constructed and then manned with armed soldiers in the pay of the company. And here we have the roots of those sepoy armies who would eventually revolt against the British East India Company in 1857. But that is in the future. Let me recap on the situation a century earlier, in 1756. Rival commercial companies with forts and armed soldiers ready to get embroiled in conflicts with each other if situations went pear-shaped in Europe. Rival Indian rulers, breaking free from centralised Mughal control, looking to increase their influence at the expense of their neighbours. Maybe, as was often the case, these regimes themselves fragmented into family civil wars, and those rulers or rival family claimants suddenly had some armed foreigners on the coast whom they could persuade to support them in return for trade concessions. Welcome to India in the mid-1700s. The south of India was a particular source of this rivalry for nearly 20 years. Three Carnatic Wars brought the French and the British 
into local conflicts supporting rival sides, all the while seeking to gain further advantages in trade deals and even land concessions. Those of you who watched my video about Hannah Snell, the woman who dressed up as a man and joined the Georgian army, might recall that she served in the first two of those Carnatic Wars here in India against the French. Whilst most of the military action took place in the south, near the British fort at Madras, now called Chennai, and the French position at Pondicherry, the rival companies had bases all around the coast of India. The British East India Company, for instance, ranged from Bombay, Mumbai, in the west, a colony, by the way, that the Portuguese had given to Charles II when he'd married the daughter of the King of Portugal, all the way round to Calcutta in the east, in Bengal. And it was heavily populated Bengal that was starting to become the main interest for the British East India Company. Thus it was that when the Seven Years' War broke out in 1756 back in Europe, with Britain and France on opposing sides, both sides decided to enhance their fortifications in Bengal. The British fort was at Fort William in Calcutta. The French one was slightly upriver and inland at Chandanaga. The ruler of Bengal, the Nawab, was not at all impressed with these fortifications. The 23-year-old Siraj Abdallah had succeeded his father as Nawab that year. Despite some commercial benefits, he was no fan of these Europeans based on his turf. And he didn't like the fact they had forts at all, let alone the fact they were now adding to them significantly. After all, they were guests in his land. He ordered them to desist immediately. The French obliged. Now, whether it was arrogance, fear of the French maybe allying with the Nawab, or using the opportunity to create a competitive advantage while those Gallics are down tools, we don't know. But what we do know is that the British kept on building. The Nawab called their bluff and gathering an army of 50,000 troops, 50 cannon and 500 war elephants, he advanced on Calcutta and on the 16th of June 1756 laid siege to Fort William. Thoroughly outnumbered, the British governor fled to the safety of a ship, as did anyone else of note, leaving a force of less than 250 men to defend the fort. This happy band, or pretty unhappy band of brothers, was commanded by the wonderfully named John Zephaniah Holwell. The account of what happened next is principally from Holwell, which has the benefits of an eyewitness account and also the opportunity for some personal spin too. Nevertheless, let's go with Holwell for the moment. Trying to hold Fort William with less than 250 men against an attacking army of 50,000 was a pretty forlorn task for any commander. Especially when this particular commander, our John Zephaniah Holwell, was not actually a soldier. In his 40s, Holwell had been born in Dublin, Ireland, but been brought up in London. And it was in the British capital that he had qualified as a surgeon at Guy's Hospital before joining the East India Company in 1732. Just five years before our story, in 1751, he had moved from his medical role in Dakar, which is now in Bangladesh, to become a zemindar, or tax collector for the company, here in Bengal. Besieged, outnumbered, the top dogs having done a runner, and now being led by a surgeon come tax collector, you can imagine how some of the defenders were feeling. Indeed, some of the local Indian sepoys started to disappear. But it wasn't just Indians who were deserting. A number of Dutch mercenaries also absconded. And later records of who was left at the fort and then who'd survived suggest some gaps in the British ranks, which can most easily be explained by desertion amongst these defenders too. After four days in the afternoon of the 20th of June, the British garrison surrendered. The jubilant victors rounded up their prisoners and looked for a place to house them. They chose a small jail in the fort that had been built to house petty criminals. And when I use the word small, I mean really small. By all account, this prison cell measured 14 feet by 18 feet, 4.3 metres by 5.5 metres for those of you who do metric. It had two windows which were heavily barred, which didn't help air circulation. The British garrison had referred to it as the black hole. And into it, according to Holwell, the Nawab's men herded 146 prisoners. Just under 70 were European soldiers, the rest were Anglo-Indian soldiers and civilians. There was even a woman, Mrs Carey, in their midst, 
Well, according to Holwell, anyway. 146 in a room that was something like 250 square feet. That accounts to just short of two square feet per person. Enough to stand up, but not to sit down. Later accounts challenged the number of prisoners, but even revised numbers, which I'll come to in a while, would have left just enough room to sit cross-legged. Whichever way you look at it, this was a squash for over 12 hours. In July, the daytime temperatures in Calcutta, Kolkata, are in the mid-30 degrees Celsius, which, when stuck in that tight room, would be bad enough. Supposedly, fires from the battle within the fort had raised temperatures closer to 40 degrees. And then there was the humidity. In July, the average humidity in the city is 85%. Very quickly, the prisoners started to cry out to the guards for water. Supposedly, the guards merely laughed at their plight. Then, Holwell offered to pay a guard a thousand rupees to move them to a larger room. However, the guard replied they would only do so on the Nawab's orders, and the victorious Nawab was now sleeping, and no one dared to wake him. So, the long, festering night continued. By 9pm, the first prisoner had died. Finally, a guard took pity on them and passed water through the bars into the prisoners' hats. Any element of European self-control broke down as the precious water was poured into the headgear, and a mad scramble took place, during which most of the water was spilt on the floor. Prisoners were reduced to licking sweat off their own and even their neighbours' bodies. As the night wore on, Holwell was aware of men dropping dead. Others fell to the floor exhausted and were too weak to stand. They were suffocated in the crush. Sometime around six o'clock the following morning, the Nawab was made aware of the situation and ordered the room to be opened. Of the 146 who had entered the black hole the previous day, just 23 had survived the ordeal. After the fall of Kolkata, the prisoners were eventually released, and Holwell was quick to bring the horrors of that night to the attention of the authorities and indeed anyone else who'd listen saying that their incarceration in the black hole was, quote, a night of hours that I will not attempt to describe, as they bar all description, unquote. Despite being too horrid to describe, Howell then proceeded to write a book all about his experiences. And therein lies part of the problem with Holwell as the prime source in this account. He also plays the role of star of the show. For instance, it was he who tried to bribe the guard, and it was he who obtained the water and tried to distribute it in his hat. The following morning, it was Holwell as commander who was singled out to meet the Nawab, who incidentally professed his ignorance as to what had been happening in his name. A protest that Holwell, interestingly, gives him the benefit of the doubt. It's a bit like those stories written by Winston Churchill about his early life. You know, there's an element of truth, but exactly where do fact and fiction depart? I said earlier that Holwell's figures have been disputed. In 1916, British historian J.H. Little cast serious doubts as to whether the event had even happened at all. However, Robert Clive, writing shortly afterwards, talks of it, as does another man who claimed to have survived by the name of Watney, who was being questioned by a parliamentary committee. And indeed, none of Holwell's enemies at the time, and he did have them in the bare pit of East India Company politics, questioned the legitimacy of his overall claim. Where there does seem some scholarly dispute is over the exact numbers. Indian professor Brijam Gupta, back in the 1950s, poured over lists of defenders, survivors, deserters, etc., and came to the conclusion that just 64 people were held in the jail. That means that each prisoner might have had a massive two square feet of space, enough to bring on suffocation and dehydration. Measure it out for yourself sometime. Fancy staying in that little space for 12 hours in the humid temperature with no water. Whilst his figures entering the black hole are lower than Holwell's, he comes in with a similar number of survivors. So even with this revisionist stance, two-thirds of the prisoners died. At the time, a chronicler in the Mughal court, Yusuf Ali Khan, quoted the event as fact and didn't lament the demise of the Europeans. In August 1756, just two months after the black hole incident, an East India Company army consisting of 1,500 men was dispatched in five ships from Madras, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Robert Clive. Clive captured Calcutta along with Fort William and went on to defeat the Nawab the following year at the Battle of Plassey. That event would bring large parts of Bengal under direct company rule and in many respects as seen as the beginning of the British Raj in India. 
Now, whether Clive was really arriving in Calcutta to retaliate for the Black Hole incident is anyone's guess. Don't forget, the East India Company had lost control of their trading base at Calcutta, and the French still had their base just up the river. Pounds, shillings and pence probably outweighed the sentimentality of revenge. Nevertheless, it was a good pretext, especially as Holwell's story had caught the public imagination back in Britain. As an aside, whilst the British East India Company were to end up as masters of India, the other European companies and national interests didn't totally disappear. Right up to the very end of the British Raj, Portuguese retained their colony at Goa. And the French also remained on the subcontinent, although their possessions were a pale reflection of what might have been when they were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British in the 18th century. Through their main colony at Pondicherry, they supervised a couple of minor settlements. Included in this number was the once powerful fort at Chandanaga, the rival to Calcutta up in Bengal. Totally eclipsed by the rising economic power of British Calcutta, it became a sleepy backwater and a somewhat bizarrely French-controlled suburb of Calcutta. All the French possessions joined India in the early 1950s. Interestingly, compared to some of the memorials erected immediately after the massacres of civilians during the revolt of 1857-58, apart from a tablet erected by Holwell, there was no recognition of the black hole victims for nearly 150 years. And by then, the Black Hole Jail, along with the Old Fort, had been demolished. It was only in 1902 that the British Viceroy, Lord Curzon, ordered a monument to be put in place, once it transpired that Holwell's original tablet had somehow disappeared. The monument became a focal point of protest during the Campaign for Indian Independence, and eventually it was moved to the graveyard of St John's Church in the city. It remains there, forlorn and pretty much forgotten, to this day. But the phrase itself, the Black Hole of Calcutta, has not been forgotten. It's passed into everyday language, even though people might not know the story behind it. It's become synonymous in the English-speaking world for an oppressive, overcrowded, uncomfortable place. It was certainly a phrase that American physicist and astronomer Robert Dick tended to use in conversation. And in his work in the 1960s, he drew a parallel with that cramped jail with the air being sucked out of it and his studies of outer space, where he used it to describe areas of space where gravity is so strong that even light cannot escape. Black holes. Well, <laughs> thanks for joining me today and I hope you enjoyed that story about a, a phrase from the English language and the history behind it. And if you enjoy my work, then why not join my supporters club? We can get my free timeline of British history. There's a link in the description below. Plenty more stories from history coming your way. But in the meantime, thanks for your support. Keep well, and I'll see you very soon.